Hello and welcome to today's LawPath webinar. Um, my name is John Morrissey. I'm, I'm part of the, the team here at LawPath and I'll be taking you through the introduction to today's webinar. So the topic for today's webinar is the five biggest challenges and solutions for, for small businesses in 2023. Um, so quickly, I suppose, to talk through the agenda for, for today's webinar. So first of all, we'll just be talking about LawPath, who LawPath are and what, what we do. Um, about Sam and James and uh, who will be taking us through today's webinar. Um, so the topics we're going to be covering today then, um, how to battle talent challenge and hire effectively um, in 2023, an action plan to deal with tricky cost hikes and how to address price hikes confidently um, is another topic, how to choose the right business tools and save money effectively, and then legal considerations when growing your online presence. So that's that's the the basics of, of what we'll be covering throughout the presentation uh, today. So a little bit first of all about LawPath and who we are. So LawPath is an online on-demand legal system um, that helps small businesses. Uh, how we do that is by helping you to create legal documents, helping to manage your compliance, and helping to connect with lawyers for consultations on demand. And we do all that through our, our single platform. So to date, LawPath has helped over 300,000 businesses uh, save a, a combined total of over $100 million. Um, we have over 10,000 uh, five-star reviews on Trustpilot also. So for the first part of today's presentation, I'll be passing over to one of our lawyer team, Sam here. Um, so Sam may be no stranger to, to some of you. If you're currently on our legal advice plan, you may have had a, a consultation uh, with Sam previously. So. I'll pass you over to Sam now, who will take us through the, the first part of our, our presentation. Thanks, John. Uh, thank you for joining us in this webinar and happy 2023 to you all. Um, so I'm just going to go through um, the, the basics of how to engage an employee uh, or a contractor for your business. Um, there are a lot of businesses out there that are facing challenges in hiring new people. Um, and uh, so We'll be going through some uh, basic issues, basic legal compliance, explaining differences between employees, contractors, and the different types of employees that you can engage, and what you need to put in your employment contracts. All right, so uh, there are broadly two different ways in which you can engage um, a worker for your business. Uh, one is to engage an employee. The other is to engage a contractor. Now, employees are broadly uh, broken down into uh, permanent employees uh, who are engaged on a regular, uh, consistent, ongoing basis, um, as well as casual. And on the other side, you've got casual employees who don't have expectation of ongoing, regular employment um, and whose hours can vary from time to time. Um, you know, permanent employees are permanent full time, part time employees. Um, they have entitlements to annual leave, sick leave, carers leave, etc. Um, and they also have set hours and days in which they work, uh, which are pre-agreed um, between the employer and employee. Full-time employees work on an average of 38 hours per week over, over their roster cycle. Part-time employees work less than that. Um, with casual employees, they don't get leave, but they get a 25% casual loading to make up for the fact that they don't have any um, entitlements to paid leave. Um, full, uh, sorry, permanent employees also have um, entitlements to uh, notice periods or if they're terminated from, from their employment, uh, whereas if you're a casual, uh, then there is no prescribed uh, notice period for termination uh, unless if you, if you specify a notice period in your employment contract. Um, now, contractors are a whole different breed. Um, a contractor is a business operator uh, in their own right. Um, and so if you engage a contractor, you're, you're basically engaging another business to provide services uh, for your business. Um, and so a contractor has a, a great deal of freedom about how they go about doing their work for you. Uh, any intellectual property they create um, would usually belong to the contractor as opposed to an employee where an employee creates intellectual property for your, uh, in the course of their employment, um, it normally gets automatically assigned to the, to the employer. Um, contractors are also responsible for their own equipment and resources, whereas with the employees, you are usually required to provide those for, for an employee. 
Uh, if you're engaging an employee, um, as well as some types of contractors, uh, you can incentivize them to stay in your business uh, for an extended period of time by offering them um, an employee share scheme or employee share options. Um, and you know, basically, you're, you're, you're giving them a stake uh, in your business, um, helping so that their interests uh, are aligned with yours. They can, they're incentivized to help your business grow um, and, and to act in the best interest of your business uh, for a period of time. Um, and usually the, the way that these uh, schemes are structured is so that um, they can't exercise their option rights or their sh uh, rights under their shares uh, until they hit some sort of a trigger point. So it might be after they've served with you for a fixed period of time uh, or, if the, you know, or, or if your business gets uh, floated on the stock exchange or gets bought out by a, by a third party investor uh, for a handsome sum of money. Um, and if, you, if your scheme complies with startup tax concession rules uh, set by the ATO, then there are also um, tax benefits uh, for your, or tax concessions, I should say, um, for your employees. Um, have a chat to your accountant, business accountant, um, if you are thinking of setting up an ESOP or an ESS, um, and to, to check whether uh, the proposed scheme complies with the startup rules or not. Um, and you know, your accountant should be able to advise you on that. Uh, so legal consider so so some financial and legal considerations when hiring employees. So you've got your wages, obviously. Um, it's not just the base rate that you've got to worry about. You've got overtime. You've got penalty rates. Um, if they're working you know, weekends or public holidays, um, you've got allowances. So they so a, a ward might um, prescribe certain allowances for things like travel, equipment, uniforms, etc. Um, you've got the costs of taking out workers' compensation insurance as well. Um, and you need to make sure that you keep accurate records of employment, such as their hours and days of work um, and, and, uh, and how much you have actually paid them for various components of their, of their wages. Um, you've also got to meet tax obligations, withhold an appropriate amount of PAYG and uh, remit um, superannuation uh, to the nominated superannuation fund uh, for, the employer, for the employee. Um, one important thing to do is uh, familiarize yourself with whether uh, your role in your business uh, um, uh, needs to refer to a, a modern award. So a modern award um, are a set of basically rules uh, that are approved by the Fair Work Commission and they set minimum standards, minimum terms and conditions of employment um, for a particular occupation uh, and within a particular business industry. Um, not all employment relationships are, are governed by an award, but some are. Um, so you, know, you can go to the Fair Work uh, website and have a look at whether an award applies for a particular role uh, or in your business, um, or just contact us and we can help you out. Uh, with your employment agreements, um, they set out the terms and ex the, term, the terms and conditions of the employment relationship. Um, as I mentioned before, research what award might apply to you. Um, get your employment uh, agreement re reviewed by a lawyer to make sure that they you know, meet with, that they comply with the national employment standards uh, in the terms of any relevant award. Um, some of the key terms that you might want to include are obligations around confidentiality, protecting your confidential info, um, assignment of intellectual property that your employees create, you know, return of any equipment that you might issue to the employee, um, Repayment of any debts, if the employee actually owes you debts, um, when and how they must be repaid, and whether you're allowed to deduct them from any payment made to the employee, um, as well as uh, post-employment restraints, like you know, uh, not poaching your clients and not poaching other employees of your business and so on. And now I'm just going to hand you to James, um, who is an accountant, and he will uh, help you with addressing price, ri price rises. Hello everyone, my name is James. I, I am a chartered accountant with Pot Business and today I'll be going through how to manage your business through a, a period of high, high or increasing costs. So as you may know, um, the RBA has lifted the cash rate every month since May 2022 and, and with that comes increased pricing goods. And today I'm just going to go through some strategies you can pull or, or lever to um, deal with these, uh, you know, price increases um, in your business. So let's move on to the next slide. So intuitively, you might think that the only the, the 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 only option you have is to increase the prices of your goods, but 
that that is only one option. There are other options or other levers you can pull in order to deal with this and keep your business afloat. Because during an, a high inflation period, uh, uh, inevitably, the profit of your business and viability of your business will take a hit. And um, you know, it's a, it's about surviving this period and, and making it to uh, to a period where the cash rate uh, is stabilized or, or starts to reduce. Okay, so. Um, our advice would be to not just focus on one lever, but you know, implement several uh, sort of strategies in order to um, in order to to deal with this this period of uh, you know uncertainty. So, I'm just going to go through each of the the strategies we have here today. So, the first one, um, like I said, would be to increase prices. Um, so, you know, in order to do this, you want to do this you know methodically. You don't you don't want to do this blindly. So um, when you're doing, when you're looking at increasing prices, you want to calculate how much um, extra it costs you to produce each unit of a good or service that you're providing. Um, so I wouldn't, we wouldn't wait, wouldn't advise that you wait for the usual price review period. You know, you, you want to do this exercise straight away. So an easy way to do this is to uh, calculate the price given that the cost of goods has increased and, and how much the price should be in order to maintain your desired profit margin. Okay, so with the increased cost, how much uh, does the price have to go up in order to maintain the profit margin? Um, you know, it's, researching the competition is a good uh, place to start, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't look too much into what the competition is doing because um, you know com the competition might have a different, uh, might have an incorrect pricing strategy. But it is a, it is good to see where you fit within the market um, and, and and your pricing to to get a good indication where you should really be unless you have some point of difference that you can hang your hat on for for a higher price um yeah so this is a good exercise to do but i don't put too much weight on the the, the results of this competitor analysis um you also want to do market research on your customers and your and, and the market that you're operating in um to assess the price sensitivity so you know are your customers willing to pay a higher price during these period this period or not you know um, is your is your customer even willing to pay for your your good or service during this period? So this is this is good information to have um, when you're making these type of decisions. Through through this market research, you might also want to find out if customers prefer small and and modest price increases as opposed to a once-off large price increase. Um, and then um, if you're not sure, if you're not if um, you don't get any definitive data out of this, try both and see how the the sales respond to this. Okay, so we just want to note with increased prices, you do run the risk of losing customers, but that's why you want to do it methodically to make sure that what you're doing, the information you're getting tells gives you the right uh, solution to, to go by in terms of increasing pricing or not. Okay, um, the next strategy we have is to lower your costs. Okay, so the benefit of this is you're obviously not, uh, you're not passing on any uh, price, uh, any cost increase to customers and your, your profit margin is protected. However, it's quite hard to do to lower your costs. So uh, generally any direct cost related to you producing um, your, your product or service is going to increase during a high inflationary period. But you can also look to decrease other costs in your business uh, in order so you don't so that you don't have to um, increase your prices essentially. So um, it would be a good exercise to go through and identify any necessary costs versus unnecessary, unnecessary costs in your business. So, for example, any unused uh, subscriptions, um, you know, you uh, I'd look to get rid of those um, straight away, and anything else that you feel that is not essential to you selling your products or costs um, would be the first uh, cost to go and, and taken out. So. Um, also on lowering your costs, uh, this is a time to focus on staff retention as opposed to uh, recruiting or hiring because the recruitment process is quite uh, expensive and you don't want to be going through this during a time where um, you know costs are high. So staff retention is always cheaper than recruiting and training new employees. Okay, recruitment fees, um, time to take to train up new new staff is always going to be a more expensive option. Um, another way you can lower your costs is to seek better pricing from alternative suppliers. So um, obviously shopping around and seeing if any suppliers can provide you with a better price or may, could mean potentially um, negotiating with your current supplier 
to see if you can get a better price. Um, and when you're doing this exercise, make sure that the quality is never compromised and that um, the, if you're going with a new supplier, um, they are able to meet your needs, okay? Other, other ways you can, you, you can reduce costs during this time is to outsource administrative functions um, to save on labor costs. So a lot of, a lot of uh, companies uh, go offshore uh, to utilize cheaper labor to do um, you know, sort of the mundane administrative business functions. So any you know, invoicing, maybe bookkeeping, things like that, it's always a good option. And also to look at your staffing and seeing whether or not um, you are being efficient with your staffing options. So try to reduce any unnecessary overstaffing. Okay, on to the next one. Um, next strategy is to adjust your products or service offering. Um, so to tackle this you know, increase in cost, you could uh, you can uh, limit price increases by reducing the, the the quantity of the product or service you're offering by keeping the price the same. So this this will essentially protect your profit margin, and your customers are, uh, can also you know the, the affordability of your product doesn't change, just the quantity, right? So. Um, Issues with this is you don't want to do this in a way. So if this affects your reputation in the market, this is not an option that you want to do. But it might, you know, this might not affect your reputation. So this could be a viable option. Okay, and when if you if you're deciding to go through with this option, you want to make sure that you are transparent with customers, and you explain to the customers why you are making this change. Okay, so it's all about transparency. I think consumers are always more receptive to um, honesty and transparency. Um, they will appreciate it more and they understand what type of, uh, you know, economic uh, period we're in right now. And, you know, if your products and, and good, if they still want to consume your product, I think they'll understand that uh, the adjustments that you have to make. Okay. Um, next uh, strategy is to improve your work, working capital position. So uh, working capital, what does that mean? It means cash, it means current assets, you know, assets that can be liquefied uh, quite easily, right? So having going into this period with strong cash reserves will always be better than um, having low cash reserves, right? Because what, what strong cash reserves gives you is time. It gives you time to consider your action plan during these infl inflationary periods, okay? So during this time, in order to improve your, your working capital position, you wanna make sure that you are on top of collecting your receivables. So that's that's your invoicing. Make sure that your customers are adhering to your payment terms and yeah, and and um, you know not not giving out too many concessions in terms of uh, collecting payment, right? So just stay efficient, making sure that you are looking at your age receivables on a on a on a timely manner and, and making sure that your team is making calls to these customers and making sure that they're making payment or at least getting at least putting it on the forefront of their mind to make payment. Okay. And then even placing a, a high priority on cash sales during this time would could be a, a way to improve the working capital position of the business. Another strategy you could use is to um, sell off any slow moving inventory that you might have. So any goods that are not selling as well, maybe discount them in order to get fast cash into the business. Um, because slow moving, slow moving inventory does nothing for your business because it's not selling, right? So you want to convert that to cash somehow. So maybe discounting it or, or bundling it with other products is a good way to um, increase your cash position for, for this time. Okay, so things to note with that is you just want to be wary that, um, you know, there isn't, you don't create any inventory shortages, okay? So sell off what you can and, and, and turn that into cash, um, but don't sell off everything because then that might create um, back order issues for your business. Moving on, um, in regards to any debts that your business may have, um, you know, uh, inevitably during a high inflation period, interest rates will increase, they will go up. So if you have the cash reserve, if you have the facilities to pay down any variable rate loans, pay them down and then restructure your debt to, to lock in a favorable fixed you know, a fixed rate loan. Um, but then again, we can't really give advice on this, but this is a strategy you could use. So if you feel like this is something you can, uh, you can, you can use in your business, speak to a broker about your options here. They'll be able to uh, help you with any financial products. Okay. Um, moving on. You want to, uh, you want to also during this time, you want to really focus your marketing activities. Okay. So instead of you really want to dial in your marketing and because marketing is such a significant cost for most businesses, you really want to type, make sure that you're getting return on your marketing spend. 
So, you know, this is about identifying what your unique selling proposition is and um, really focusing your marketing towards uh, generating leads from this this um, this uh, differentiating point, right, from your competitors. So uh, another thing you might want to do is focus the marketing on your high margin products, but also keep in mind if your most popular product is a low margin product, then you want to focus some, some, some of the marketing spend there as well. Um, and also identifying which customers, which of your customers are more or less price sensitive and you, also, you obviously want to target the less price sensitive customers. Um, and another, another thing you might consider, target customers who might want to bring forward spending in order to beat any uh, potential price increases in the future. So we do see this a lot where, you know, for example, um, a lot of uh, if a lot of event companies are having their uh, Christmas parties booked now because they just don't want to anticipate any um, any any future price increases uh, in the year because we don't know. You know, historically the cash rate has increased every month since May, and it doesn't look like it's going down anytime soon. So, you know, target those customers who are looking to get things done as soon as possible to in order to beat any potential um, price increases. Um, moving on, um, yeah, so just in terms of sales contracts that you may have with your customers, yes, we, I understand that fixed price long-term contracts are always going to be the go because it guarantees the revenue for a long term. You don't have to worry about it. However, they do not account for economic fluctuations and having a fixed term contract may leave you worse off um, during these high, you know, high um, inflationary periods, you know, periods where uncertainty and um, um, there's, there's, there's big fluctuations in the price of goods. So um, a, a strategy you could use is to include variable pricing mechanisms in your contracts. You know, this could be tied to um, CPI, uh, the CPI index or, or things like that, just to make sure that you're being covered if there are increases in price, in the price of goods. Okay. Um, and anything, things you can do now is maybe even communicating to your customers and saying, Hey, can we revise, can we revise the contracts? Uh, and maybe give them an, an incentive to revise your contracts or um, start, you know, or reduce the term of the fixed, the fixed uh, term as well. Uh, reducing the term of the fixed price contract um, will leave you better off than having it fixed for a long term, just to account for any, um, any changes or fluctuations in the economy. Okay. Uh, just moving on. You want to, during this time, you know, I guess, you know, time is money, right? So you want to improve the efficiency of your business during this time. So it could be a good time to look at um, technology solutions to help your business run more efficiently. So looking at things that automate, you know, administrative processes and, and you know, AI is a big thing that's coming up. So looking at how you can leverage AI to sort of make your business uh, run more smoothly and, and make it easier for customers to um, purchase your products, so that could be by way of a, a new website or a mobile app. Again, it's it's a, if if you have the funds to do this, this could be a, a viable solution um, because you want to make it as easy as possible for your customers to buy your product, and you also want it to make it easy as possible on your end internally to uh, fulfill those products. Okay, so tech is a great way to do this. Uh, moving on to my last point, we've spoken about all the strategies and. And, and you want to quantify these strategies and see how they would work, right? So it's now more important than ever to perform analysis, financial analysis. So that could be about by way of a cash flow forecast. It could be by way of a budget, putting in a budget, right? So with the great thing about these forecasts and budgets, you can play around with the numbers and you can run different scenarios to see what the end result will be. So, for example, if the cost of if you, the cost of a good you anticipate is going to increase by a certain percentage, you can put that into your cash flow forecast to see what it does to your cash balance at the end of the period, um, and, and vice versa. You know, if you increase the price, what will that do to the sales quantity? Will it reduce the sales quantity uh, to a point to below what your previous sales level was, and that could overall affect your overall profitability? So, it's good to run different quantitative scenarios and see how the profit or the bottom line and the cash position changes based on these estimated numbers, okay? So it won't be exact, but you, you wanna have a good idea of what it will look like, okay? Uh, moving on, uh, I'll pass it over to John to uh, go through how to choose the right business tools to save money. Thanks, James. 
So yeah, mo moving on then. So our next slide then on how, how to choose the right business tools to save money. So obviously, why is this important? Choosing the right tools can streamline your processes, um, which means you as the, the owner of the business or the CEO can focus on growing the business. So obviously, you, you want to put as much of your time as possible in, into what's going to make the business money and grow the business going forward and ha have these processes streamlined as much as possible. So um, here's just a few examples of, of different services and different tools that you can use that can help you you know, track a task digitally and keep on top of your operations. So um, these tools can get busy business owners um, who want to save time on communicating or tracking work of employees. Um, so that, that's the benefit of, of using tools like this. So I suppose, you know, to go through a few tools that LawPath would have as part of our platform, um, firstly, we'd have our legal workflows. So whether you're looking to say hire an employee or, or dismiss an employee, uh, start a website or, um, you know, start up a trust or collecting a debt, um, we would have different legal workflows that take you through step by step the, the processes involved in that. So the different processes, the steps, you, the boxes you need to tick and, you know, the different documents that you're going to need in order to move through those those steps. So we have workflows as part of our offering that that can guide you through all those processes um, for those, those examples. So another tool um, that we have, it's a pretty new one on our site um, that you may not be familiar with yet. It's our, our business structure test. So what we find from talking to new companies and new startups is sometimes it's very difficult to know what business structure is going to suit my business best. So, you know, would I be best operating as a sole trader or, or do I need to be a limited company? Um, is what I'm doing suitable for a partnership? So those are all questions that, that we get asked on a daily basis. So what we've developed and it's available on our platform is a quiz. So by answering a few you know, simple questions, we, we can make recommendations on what business structure might suit you best. Or if, if you're, you're a customer of ours and you're on a legal advice plan or a legal and accounting advice plan, then you, know, you can have a talk with a lawyer on you know, what type of company structure might, might suit you best. And you can have a 30 minute call on that. Or if you want to talk to an accountant on our accounting plan, you can speak about, you know, tax structuring the business correctly um, and that side of things as well. So that, that's always good to, to keep in mind. Another tool we offer then will be our legal documents and e-signatures. So, you know, if you're familiar with the LawPath platform, you'll know that we have a huge volume and a huge library of legal documents. So whether it's legal documents, employment type documents and workplace policies or HR type documents, we've got a lot of bases covered there on the platform so you know you can browse through there and, and see see what we have available and these these document templates are very easy to customize and use and as it says on the slide there in front of me it does come with our e-signature feature as well so it's very simple and you don't have to pay an external e-signature provider as part of your, your law path subscription you have access to e-sign all your documents and to send them to your clients um associates to sign also. So that, that's very, very useful too. Um, there's just one more slide here as well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pass you back through to, to James just to talk about the accounting side of the tools. Hey again, everyone. So um, in terms of accounting tools, if you, you know, when you're running a business, I, I feel my, my advice always is to get an accounting software. It's a non-negotiable. Okay. So if you're running a business, it's the only way to try the only alternative to an accounting software is to do things manually in Excel. And that's not a very time efficient thing to do. As a business owner, you are time poor. You'd rather have it a, a tech solution, okay? So we recommend either Zero or MYOB uh, as an accounting software. Definitely, to me, it's a non-negotiable. So even when you're doing your end of year compliance, your accountant will ask you for an accounting software. Otherwise, they will charge you extra in order to go through the data that you already have. Okay, so um, zero makes it easy to uh, zero makes it easy to meet your end of year compliance, but it also makes it easier for you to do your compliance along the way. So whether it's GC reporting, PAYG reporting, um, if you're if you have uh, employees, you need to do mandatory STP reporting uh, with the ATO. So you can only do this through a cloud based accounting software. So as you can see, it is quite uh, quite an essential tool that you must have. Uh, when, when you're thinking about accounting processes and tax processes within your business. Okay, uh, moving it along, we're gonna talk about, uh, I'll pass it over to Sam to talk about 
uh, legal considerations when growing your online presence. Thanks, James. All right, so moving on. So uh, if you want to grow your online business presence, um, and, and particularly if you're running an e-commerce type business, um, then you've got the same legal obligations as you would if you're running a physical uh, business from a physical premises. Um, typically speaking, you've got, you'd have, you need your website terms and conditions of use, uh, which governs um, the relationship between your business and the end user of the business's website. Um, if you are selling goods from your website via the website, uh, then you should also have sale terms and conditions as well. Um, and if you collect any private uh, personal information from your clients, then you should also have a privacy policy. Um, we've got uh, template documents, uh, templates uh, for, for these documents in the document library. Um, so feel free to have a look if you're a subscriber to our legal advice plan. If you're not, um, just contact us and uh, we'll let you know about how to, how to get, on, get onto the plan. Um, now, intellectual property. So if you're running a online business, um, IP is going to form a, a big part of the assets of your business and the value of your business. Um, and so that can include not just the source code and the images and the video and the text that comprise your website, but also uh, your brand uh, by way of trademarks, um, as well as other material that you might have, copyright and so on. Um, now, when you first start a business or a company, um, typically your IP is basically all you've got. It, it, it'll be your main business asset. Um, and so if you're developing a website, for instance, um, it's very important to make sure that your uh, agreement with the developer um, assigns the rights over the IP that they create to you, to you or to your company. Um, if you're running a business through a company and you or your co-founders are developing um, the product, developing the website or an app or piece of software, um, then you'll have to make sure that you assign, that you and your co-founders assign um, your intellectual, your personal intellectual property rights uh, to the company so that the company um, legally owns that IP. Later on, when you when you go talk to investors, the investors will want, will want to know that um, that the company actually owns all that IP. Um, if you've never given thought to it, uh, it might be worthwhile doing an IP audit. Have a think about what sort of intellectual property um, your business actually has or uses, um, whether the, that intellectual property actually belongs to your business or whether they still belong to somebody else. Um, and whether you need to register any registrable IP rights, such as trademarks, patents, um, designs for physical products, and so on. Okay, so uh, give us a call if you need any help with these. All right, so marketing and advertising. Um, so we're going to go very quickly through the Spam Act and another thing that's not mentioned on here, which is the Do Not Call list. So if you're sending uh, marketing material using email, uh, or, or via text message, um, then you need to comply with the SPAM Act. The SPAM Act governs um, the sending of commercial electronic communications. Um, and the general, the general gist of it is that, first of all, you can't send uh, commercial electronic communications to uh, people unless you have their consent. Now, consent may be expressed, so they might specifically say that they consent, uh, or it can be inferred. So let's say if they, you know, if they display their contact details on a business website, um, then it might be inferred that they are happy to receive business communication through that, through that, through those, uh, through those contact medium. Um, on the other hand, if they, if you're just scraping um, contact details off a, a personal social media page, that then you probably can't infer that they are willing to uh, accept um, commercial electronic communication that way. Um, your commercial electronic communication needs to include um, uh, your identifier, so the sender's uh, legal name, uh, ABN or ACN, and contact details. Um, those messages must also include an unsubscribe feature uh, or a way to respond to that message so that they can be taken off the, um, off the email list or text message list. Um, there are some exemptions, government bodies, political parties, and so on, but for most small businesses that won't really apply. Uh, the other thing that I mentioned was the do not call list. So the Australian government maintains a, a register of telephone numbers that marketers should not call. Um, and so if you are in the business of cold calling, 
uh, or doing any kind of telemarketing and you call out, so you do outbound, mar- mar- outbound um, telephone marketing, then you need to wash your your telephone list against the do not call list and you can obtain a, a, a obtain the do not call list from uh, from the Australian Communications and Media Authority. Um, and if you if you fail to do that um, and you end up calling somebody who's on the do not call list, there are there are fines that apply. Uh, PCI DSS. Um, so this is uh, a compliance requirement if you handle payment details. So if you handle your clients um, or your customers' payment, uh, the bank details or credit card details, and um, the level of compliance you have to go through um, depends on the number of transactions um, you take and you undertake each year. So if you process more than six million transactions a year, then you'll probably have to do a full security audit. And, and produce a, um, a report of compliance. Um, if you do less than that, then um, your bank or, or merchant service provider will have different requirements. Um, if you don't do many transactions at all, um, uh, quality or security audit might, might just be voluntary. Um, be guided by your bank or your merchant service provider's requirements um, for this. And uh, all uh, sale transactions or provision of services are governed by Australian consumer law. Um, if the value of that service is less than $100,000, um, or if it is for something that is bought uh, or service that is rendered for personal or domestic use. Um, so there are guarantees around acceptable quality, fitness for purpose that you can't contract out of. Um, if you don't supply goods or services that are of acceptable quality, or that are fit for purpose, um, then you're required to either resupply that good or service. If it is a product, then you might need to repair it. Um, if it is, uh, if you can't repair or replace, um, then you might need to provide a refund to, to your client. Um, in all circumstances, you can't engage in any kind of misleading or deceptive conduct. So in other words, don't lie to your customers. Um, you can't make false representations. If you want to use testimonials, they have to be genuine. You can't just copy paste testimonials from some other website. Um, and if you're running a healthcare business, um, you can't you you can't show sorry you can't use testimonials um, about the clinical quality of your care. So you, know, you can't say Doctor X is a genius diagnostician. Like you can't say that sort of that kind of stuff. Um, unconscionable conduct. So that relates to customers who might be particularly vulnerable. Um, so, you know, if you're pressuring a customer to sign a contract and they clearly can't understand English, then obviously that's unconscionable conduct. If they're suffering from some sort of a mental disability and you're pressuring them to enter to sign up for a service, then again, unconscionable conduct. Unfair terms are terms that are really lopsided towards one particular party. Um, in a contract that's issued on a take it or leave it basis. So if you're not willing to negotiate on a contract in a, in a genuine way, um, and it contains terms that are really um, biased in your favour, um, then a court might find that, that, that that's actually not enforceable and strike it out. Um, they can also penalise you for having un- unfair contract terms. Um, so those kind of terms might be, you know, being able to change your prices without any notice to the customer, um, you know, locking your customer in for like long duration contract without them having any right of termination and things like that. And I'll hand you back to John to talk about how Wolfart can help you. Thanks, Sam. So to, to finish off the webinar today, um, we're going to talk a little bit about how Lawpack can help. And then after that, we will have our webinar exclusive offer today for, for the webinar viewers. Um, so stick around for that. So how Lawpack can help. So obviously, we can help with, with contract management for your business. So we spoke earlier on about those that document library that, that we have with the 350 different legal templates. So we can help with those templates by providing, you know, essential legal documents to your business. You can quickly customize a, a document, download it, e-sign it. Um, and st- the, it works as a contract management system in that you can store these documents and keep them for reference on, on your LawPad account. We also spoke a little bit about creating personalized workflows. So as we said, whether you're trying to hire an employee, dismiss an, an employee, possibly create a trust or collect a debt, whatever it may be, we do have different uh, legal workflows that can walk you through how, how to do each of these and follow the steps effectively and, and legally. And then lastly, um, by booking in legal consultations or, or accounting consultations. So if, if you need advice on a topic or possibly contract review, 
that's covered under our legal advice or legal and accounting advice plans. And you get unlimited 30 minute phone and video calls uh, with a lawyer or an accountant as it may be um, for to discuss any commercial topics related to your business or for contract review. We also then, another feature of our platform is our, is our legal health check. So as you'll see from the slide, you can complete a legal health check. Um, so this report would cover and evaluate your current business structure and the strength of your employment and, and contractual agreements and the status of your, your policies, especially around privacy, which, which can be topical at the moment, and the website terms and conditions and protecting your, your IP, your, your, your company's intellectual property. So based on your, your answers to our, our legal health check on our platform, it, it will give you a scorecard of, of how your business is performing and how, how your business is set up from that point of view. Um, so that's definitely worth checking out um, and it's completely free to use on, on our platform for, for all users. So this is our, our webinar special offer then for, for today's attendees and, and viewers. Um, so on our legal advice plus accounting package, we're offering a, a special offer of a three month trial at $199 per month. It, it, it really does um, represent fantastic value. Normally the plan retails at $293 per month as, as you'd see below and see on our website on a 12 month contract. So for today's webinar users, you can avail of a three month trial with no longer term obligation. Try it out for three months and, and you know see, see how really great the offering is with access to all your, your legal documents and legal workflows access to speak to a lawyer on demand with unlimited 30 minute phone and video calls and, and the same for, for accounting purposes. So if you would like to avail of this offer, you can type yes into the chat or if you've been sent a recording of this webinar, uh, reply to the email and um, a sales representative will, will be in touch with you shortly to, to help set up on that or to, to tell you more about it. Um, so that's that's where we conclude today's webinar. Um, again, if you have any questions on, on anything covered in today's webinar, there is the, the legal advice plan and legal plus accounting plans, which, which can be accessed. And there is the webinar special offer. So if you do have any questions, you can reply to, to the email um, that, that was sent out and a sales representative or a customer service representative will be in touch to, to help you out. Um, so thanks, thanks for attending today's webinar and uh, we'll, we'll see you guys next.